You're listening to a podcast from The Word. We forgot to mark Paul Simon's birthday, really, so better late than never. He was 80 last week. Um, and there was a documentary, isn't there, on, on BBC? Of, Which was uh, really, really good. About the making of Still Bridget. on iPlayer, I think. It's so good, made in 2011. I thought that was fantastic. I mean, you, you liked it too, didn't you? It was amazing. Yeah, it was about the making of Bridge Over Troubled Water. So a certain amount of it was obviously shot at the time. And uh, i tell you what I came away thinking, um, is the thing that, that with with Paul Simon is uh, insufficient focus on. Is the, people talk about, you know, wonderful literate songwriter and so forth, and the folk tradition, all this sort of thing. But actually the key thing, the key shaping factor in Paul Simon is Brill building pop music because that's where he came from. You know what I mean? He was doing this stuff as a teenager and he's all about tune first over absolutely anything. You know what I mean? He, and uh, and I was, I've just compiled a little list I've got in front of me, Mark, a little, little quiz for you. Okay. Can you sing the opening, uh, the opening verse of Mrs. Robinson? How, what are the words? Let's oh Lord! Da, 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 there you go. It's actually D. I think he does. There are no words. That's, right. well, that's my point. It's what's the What's question. the opening of uh, of America? America from uh, bookend by Simon Garfield. Oh, that's got no lyrics too. It starts in. Mm, that's right. That's mm. right. Well, it, what's the opening of Slip Sliding Away? Ooh, yeah, yeah, yes, it is. What's the chorus of the boxer? Uh, Lila, 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 Lila. You know, it's, which is brilliant because he said in the in the in the documentary that he he just he couldn't think of any more words, so he just sang Lila, Lila, and that becomes the kind of epic build for the whole song. Absolutely, <laughs> my God, can I just say that? What an amazing film! What I loved about that film was the way that they go into the detail. Of the sound. Is it Roy Haley, the sound Roy engineer? Roy Haley, yes. Yeah. Roy Haley. And he talks about the detail of how they got the sound on the boxer. You know, they went off and recorded it in a, in a chapel in Columbia University to get that echo. You know, Cecilia, they went to various college gigs, didn't they? Yeah. To record just the clapping of the audience to put onto the album. It's absolutely amazing. It's extraordinary, Bridge of Troll Water, because it's actually... I mean, in terms of the amount of material, it, it it's quite thin, really. I mean, it's got two or three extraordinary songs, Bridge Over Top of Trouble Water, uh be, being being one and 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 the boxer. The boxer. Uh, but I mean, a lot of it, you know, it's bye bye love is you know Everly Brothers. Yeah, song. Everly Brothers song. You Cecilia know, that, is kind of slightly throwaway. It, it is mean? slightly it throwaway, is. it's really yeah. good, but it's slightly throwaway. El Condor Passa is, you know, an old, it's an old folk song. Old folk song, which I think he bought the rights to and then wrote lyrics, didn't he? Yeah. So, so, so in that sense, it's it's quite thin. And but the thing that struck me about it is uh, is that it it it's a real kind of uh, pivotal record, in the sense that it's a record, and it's probably the first one. That is about sound rather than songs, isn't it? It's about getting a sound right. Getting, Which it's is about entirely texture. what that documentary is about. It's it about is. every single bit of it. They work out. If we, the, Ray, Roy talks about going around the studios and clapping. When he yeah. hears the best echo, he says to the drummer, set your drums up. Set your here. drums up there. And they record things actually in the echo chamber, don't they? And, and the boxer, exactly. the boxer is an amazing example of this because it, it's very few people playing on that. There, you know, there's there's Joe Osborne on the bass, there, and there's yeah. Hal Blaine who's playing his drums out in the stairwell at Columbia, that's right. basically, because that's where they can get the echo. You know, so that you hear that extraordinary crashing sound. Yeah, it's just him hitting a single snare, but the amount of echo on it. And I think there's a bass harmonica in, on there as well. And the great Fred Carter plays guitar. But it's quite sparse, really. It is. But he's made enormously dramatic by the way it's recorded. And it, I think it really was a kind well, of the big, details, a big shift. The bit on Cecilia where they, they get a load of drumsticks and drop them on a parquet floor just to get yeah. the scattering sound. Yeah. And the rhythm track they'd all recorded at a party around at Paul Simon's house. They bring in the cassette, stick it on the studio uh, 
machinery and, and tinker with it and use that as a loop, an early loop. It's amazing. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, I, I thought the detail was fantastic. It's very oh good. My well, God, what a lyricist he is. Don't you think? I mean, my God. I've squandered my resistance for a pocket full of mumbles. Such a promise. All promises. lies and jests. Still a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. Disregards. And that's a fantastic. Using the word disregards in the lyric and making yeah. it so musical is, uh, yeah. No, it's, it's fantastic. So happy birthday to him. Happy birthday to Paul Simon. I so go back to your 70s records. Yes, I got asked to do this and um, by the Radio Times because Dylan, Dylan Jones, friend of the pod, um, is is doing a, a two-part thing, I think, on BBC Four about by music the of the 80s, celebrating the music of the 80s. And Radio Times were running a piece about this, and and they just thought, oh, let's get a bit of <laughs> let's get a bit of balance or something. I don't know what. They rang me up, and it's it's one of those things I've been thinking about it ever since. I thought, if the eighteen year old me, me had been told that one day, many many years in the future, somebody would ring up and say, just pick five records to represent a decade, just do it. You know what I mean? Unscientifically. And we're going to run it in one of the highest circulation magazines in the UK, you know, still in this day and age. Uh, but yeah, I would be thrilled to bits. And I, all I could think of at the time was, oh, I've got to get this done quickly because I can't think about it too much. And I actually, I, I actually threw a few. I, I don't know if I threw a few ideas at you via you WhatsApp, did. and I'll make I threw a few back. Yeah, but you. I just wanted to see what people came up with, really. You know, I, it was just a bit of a parlor game. Uh, but to, and have to, to have to, to restrict <laughs> it to five is ridiculous. Well, like so, so come on, reveal. I want to know. Okay. In, in no particular or other. They're, in, they're in no, order. they're not in an order at all. They're not Go in an order. This is just stuff that, you know, you've got to pick five tunes. It's going to represent the... The, the kind of range of stuff that, uh, that happened in the 70s and and also the kind of lasting legacy of the music of the 70s. I picked, in no particular order, I Feel Love by Donna Summer. That's a good choice. Um, That's a good choice. So stop there. That's because that was, no one had made a record like that before. Nobody had made a and record like that. becomes the kind of foundation for, I suppose, for sort of a form of electronic dance music thereafter. Am I right? Yeah, definitely. And uh, Brian, the story goes that Brian Eno took it, the record into the studio when he was recording with David Bowie in Berlin and said, This is how records will sound in the future. And if he did say that, he was completely how right. right he, was. <laughs> he was completely right about it. And the thing, incredible. That, the thing that interests me about it is going back and listening to it is, is you know, dance records in the 60s had been about songs. And dance records in the 70s, post I Feel Love, they, they become about grooves. And actually, the key thing, the key bit in I Feel Love is where he makes everything disappear apart from the groove. And technologically, you couldn't do that in the 1960s. You couldn't have done that on a Motown record. You know what I mean? Because no. they were... They're played and recorded in a certain way. Whereas if you're making a record the way Jill John Moroda was starting to make him in 1976, 77, you could do that. And that's the most attractive bit of the record is where everything goes away but the groove. So that's one. Okay. Here, another one, and just completely different. You've Got a Friend by Carol King. Clearly the kind of enormous song of 1971, 1972 in her version and James Taylor's version and... Carol King, a genius, and heralded in the whole era of the singer songwriter. And there's a whole singer yeah, songwriter. A whole new record. But it's also had, had, had a fantastic knack for simplicity. It was just absolutely remarkable. And the thing that strikes you when you go and listen to that now is if it were done now or in the 90s or the 80s, it would be overdone. It just would be. It would be done again and again, you know. The, it would be vibrato and huge, great orchestras, and it would be just over the top. Whereas if you listen to it in 1971, it's incredibly modest. That's the amazing thing. The big song of the year was given the most modest possible treatment. So that's my second one. Okay, yeah. so I Feel Love by Donna Summer. Um, You've Got a Friend by, by Carol King. In no particular order, my third one, Born to Run by Bruce Springsteen. It's, okay. it's far and away the best record Bruce Springsteen ever made. 
And it's representative of the fact that you've got a load of people in the 70s, a lot of people came to prominence in the 70s who were massively uh, influenced by the music of the 60s. And so what's interesting about Born to Run is it's kind of, it's sort of remaking the Spectre experience and the Motown experience in the rearview mirror. You know what I mean? It, it's rather self-consciously deploying the elements of youthful romance to apply to somebody in their 20s. And it's also less a song than a blueprint for a performance. You know, you go and listen to that record, and <laughs> it absolutely fascinates me, is that uh, is all, all the bits where it kind of stops and starts again. And, you know, there's, there's a bit near the end where it, where it stops and he goes, one, two, three, and it starts again. You know what I mean? Yes. And does, nobody yeah. made records like that in the 1960s. You couldn't do that kind of thing in the 1960s. You could do that in the 1970s. And people go and see you know, when, when this bloody war is over and if Bruce Springsteen goes back on the road, people would go see Bruce Springsteen and he'll probably do want to run. And, w- and what they'll want most from the evening 40 years later is that sound. You know, they, they they want to be put back there in that sound. So that's that's and my... also that took him more into a kind of singles market, didn't it? Because you had to even big albums acts had to have hit singles. Oh, yeah, well, definitely. It was the way it was one of the things that you know broke him through in, in the United States, certainly. So number four, very good. Okay, number four, Exodus, Bob Marley and the Wailers. Yeah, Bob, Bob I was Marley. going to say there has to be a Bob Marley. Song you you there. just because the thing that people forget about Bob Marley, and we remember because we were there, is he did everything and he did it all at the same time. You know, <laughs> you know the, the thing about Bob Marley was. Are you talking he, about the track here or, or the album? The track I'm talking about the track. In yeah, each yeah, case, yeah. I'm talking about the track. All tracks. Um, you know, the, the, you know, this is simultaneously a kind of political rallying cry. But it was also a dance tune. You know, it was also, it was daytime radio. It was also an enemy favourite. All those things were going on absolutely all at the time, all at the same time with Bob Molly. And also, the, that was the point where, where he got to the kind of biggest mass market, wasn't it? Absolutely. And and the thing that's still amazing is that he, he you know, he was kind of produced from the culture of a, of a strange religious group on the other side of the world, you know, with 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 kind of roots in in, in uh, you know in East Africa and all that kind of stuff, and yeah, it completely made sense to people absolutely all over the world because of the way he does it. Because Bob Marley had had the knack, like Paul McCartney has the knack, of just knowing what a hook was and knowing how to make something memorable. It, the, those things are so tuneful. Those things are so infectious still. So that's Bob Marley. It is extraordinary. We accepted that religion, didn't we? We kind of didn't, oh, we, yeah. we didn't fully understand it. We endorsed no. the fact that he endorsed it. And yeah, absolutely. It absolutely. became fashionable and, and cool. And and my final one is is Lost for Life by Iggy Pop. All oh, right, good. Because, because the interesting thing that's about the 70s is, is there's so many great records in the 70s that weren't hits in the 70s because there wasn't room for them to be hits in the 70s because there were too many other records and too many other you know ways of, of uh, absorbing people's attention. And the amazing thing about Lust for Life is, you know, recorded in 1977, and, you know, it, it, it didn't really come to prominence until train spotting. Until train spotting. Yeah. Was that 20 years later? Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it was 77, wasn't it? Because I was just going to say, why haven't you had anything from the late 70s? But you sort of have. There's loads of things from the late 70s there. Eh? I mean, Donna Summers from the late 70s. I feel loved from the late 70s. Oh, was that something? Was that, was that something? I thought it was 76. No, maybe not. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's the late 70s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the latter half of. Um, and, and the thing about, you know, Lust for Life. Is you play it again now, and it's damn nearly fifty years later, and you can't go and make that sound anymore. You can't do it, you know. And you just, you know, the technology has kind of moved on too fast, too far. What to was make... it about that sound you're talking about? The kind of, it's analogness. It's it, it's. I suppose it probably is. Kind of yeah. Texture of it. Yeah, and it, 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 it sounds absolutely out of control. Um, so the, those are my five. Those are my five did, to, did, to did bat the, against the 80s. Can you reveal what Dylan's were? I, mean, I don't know. Is, I don't know. Oh, we don't know yet. 
I don't know. Is that? I've no, I've no idea. Um, but anyway, those are my five. Very so good. People might like to contribute their own and you know point out where I'm wrong. I'm sure they will wish to do that. The Word Podcast: Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. I was up very early this morning to take the good lady wife to the tube, and uh, and so I was listening to the beginning of the Today program at six o'clock this morning, and they were trailing the menu of things. And saying, um, Adele's got a new record out, and we're going to find out what the critics think. And I thought, who cares, <laughs> honestly? Does it make the slightest difference to, to the success or otherwise of Adele's record? What anybody thinks about it, you know, anybody, any kind of inky scribbler. But then it reminded me of a, of a syndrome that we're all very familiar with. You know, you're probably thinking, why do the Today program do these items, you know? And I'll tell you for why. Because well, they're doing it to desperately court kind of uh, teenagers or 22-year-olds, aren't they? No, they're not. No, no, think so? no. Nobody's turning on. No, no, nobody goes nowadays, goes, oh, quick turn on Radio 4. They're talking about Adele. They're doing it because the people on the programmes, they desperately want to play some music in their program, You know, because... They've got an hour and it's taken up with speech and they're desperate for anything that is not speech. And so this is why on Radio 4 particularly, current affairs programmes, they grab desperately any opportunity to feature music because they can play a bit of music for 30 seconds or Which or makes a, a lot of difference on that programme. It's just for God, own, it breaks up the rhythm of it, it? Relentless, yeah, grim news. And suddenly, Adele. Yeah, absolutely. It's why, it's why their, their Beatles obsession yeah. continues unabated. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's that's that. Uh, Casey Musgraves, who we were only talking about last week, because uh, she'd appeared... Oh, yeah, not eligible for the country awards. <laughs> she'd appeared... She'd appeared no, that's in, interesting. Is that anything to do with it? Because last week... No, we, it's we, not we, the country awards, Mark. It's not the country awards. She's not, ava- not eligible... Her album is not eligible for the country category, a category in the right. Grammy Awards. Now, this is a very different thing. And we've all noticed that over the years that the Grammys just grow new categories absolutely all the time. Uh, you know, so that all shall have prizes and, and every section of American radio shall somehow feel involved. But this is the first case I recall of somebody being told Sorry, you can't be country anymore. You have been in the past. You're not country anymore. And it's just, who's in charge of this? How are they possibly making these kind of judgments? I can't imagine. Can you? No, I don't know how you define that. She wasn't particularly country anyway, was she? Well, I don't know. No, she probably... Although in her appearance on Saturday Night Live, Stark Naked the other day, she did wear... The only thing she's wearing is a pair of of cowboy boots. Well, there you go. So that's a little bit of association. Absolutely. Do you think that that incident has in any way affected their judgment? Are they trying to... uh, I don't know. No, I would music imagine, fraternity is quite conventional. I would imagine they're trying to get her out of it because they they worry she might win it. I suppose you know that. Uh, what well, win it over somebody who is far more authentically country? Well, but because here's the thing about about competitions of any kind, whether they're um, you know awards or they're charts or yeah. anything, is if you're outside, you want the category to be wider. If you're inside you want the category to be narrower. That's just human human nature, you know. Uh, so if you're in the running, you want a narrower category. If you're not in the running, you want it to be wider. And so she's a bit of a victim of that. But it made me think of something that somebody sent me. I, I asked yesterday, as usual, you know, any agenda items people wanted us to talk about on the podcast. And, and this is particularly in, in, interesting and, and uh, you know, related to that point. Frosty morning, but that's how he's known to his nearest and dearest. Why doesn't everybody use their real name on Twitter? I don't know. Frosty, frosty morning, anyway. It says there are great pop, blues, rock, folk, and soul artists from both UK and USA. Lots of cross influencing, originality, etc. But I'm struggling to think of Brit contributions of a similar level in country music. He says, Why? And it's fa- fair point. There aren't any. Are they? There just aren't any. Because I think, well, it's a, it's a fundamentally 
almost totally American concept, isn't but it? But also, it's an identity thing, isn't it? Music, country music is about that, isn't it? It's about coming from the United States, from certain states, certain parts of, the United, of America, of the United States, dressed in a certain States, way, dressed coming in from a certain way. kind of rural background. Yes, and being a kind of regular AC person. philosophy, exactly. You can't, and if you come from, uh, you come from a time now, or it's, it's not rock. happening. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just not happening. But you might well say the same ought to have applied to kind of, you know, the animals who came from Wall's End, um, you know, doing R&B. But it didn't. Whereas country music, it does. And uh, I think Frosty... You've got to dress a certain way. It it just wouldn't look authentic, would it? It would not But also, you can't... It's not just dressing a certain way, you know, because if you... If you were to be a British country star, if you can imagine that, and you were to appear, you know, with the, with the cowboy hat and the boots and the pickup truck, and then and and you would have to, do you know what you'd have to do? Quite early on in your career, Mark, you would be forced to do the following: you would be forced to appear in a video with wearing a the, cowboy hat. No, no, Mark, I'm going further. What's the thing you got to do if you're an American country star? In some video, you have to appear with the American flag. Yes, I suppose you, you have, have to do it. Because what? Possibly with an American car. Because it, it's kind of interesting because it kind of it spreads outside the country because you could say, and I, I know I've said this in print um, before, American solo stars. American music is about American at some level. It is in a way that British music is not about, about Britain. French music is not. Why about are Britain. they so obsessed with their own identity? Well, it, it, it's it, well, if you go in an American bookstore, you see 50% of the titles in American bookstore are called American so-and-so, American carnage, but American what? dirt. Well, because... Well, the idea is is a country you've chosen, or your forefathers chose to go to, and it's a concept, and it's a city on the hill, and all that sort of stuff that we're all used to. Just you know, we they ever they absorb that with mothers. And they're and very much like the idea that they live in the center of the universe, don't they? Of course they do. So you know, you couldn't have our country star from Rygate or Townmouth would very quickly be faced with the problem: Do I? be photographed with the American flag. And then you would go on a, a chat show. People go, hang on, you, you come from Rygate. <laughs> it doesn't work. You know, it doesn't. doesn't work at all. So it's, that's, it's as simple as that. You know, that's, that's country music dealt with. This is a junction in the word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. And we're joined by Jeff Reese, whose birthday it is. And Jeff's a Patreon supporter. So he joins us uh, on the. Is it actually and today? Many happy returns. Is it it today? is my birthday today. In fact, the fifteenth. Oh, yes. good for you! How is that going to be uh, celebrated? Um, a few drinks with the missus um, out in town later. I think, yeah. Right. And we're staying in a hotel, and we're going to my favourite restaurant. So, yeah. Oh my goodness! Wow, where is that? Whereabouts? It's in Swansea. It's in Swansea. It's called Fabulous. La Brasse. Good yes, for you. Yes, yeah, great. She, she's a vegetarian, but I'm, I'm a massive meat eater. Uh, a bit like you, uh, Mark, and your um, Chrissy Hint uh, story there. Um, yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, the pate de foie gras. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I yeah, couldn't understand so. why I had a reputation for being a meat eater. Of course, that's right. <laughs> and the pate de foie gras. Story. Yeah, followed it by the, the rare lamb chops. I know, I know. So, <laughs> Jeff, it, Jeff is a custom long established, i.e. we did it last week. Uh, for uh, you know, for our birthday guest to to propose a subject for discussion or a question you've got or, or some observation of a popular nature, what what have you come up with, Jeff? Okay, so I've got some questions for individually for David and for, right, for, uh, okay. for Mark. We'll start with uh, uh, Mr. Hepworth. Um, okay, Queen Elizabeth Grammar School. Yes, the coat of arms. What three things are on the coat of arms? Oh, I don't know. I could tell you the motto. I can't tell you. Oh, God, I don't know. The, the motto is Turpain is scary. That's right. And what does that mean? It is disgraceful to be ignorant. 
that was my next question. Well done, very good. <laughs> Can't tell you what's on the badge. Okay, a lion, an owl, and Bible. All right, okay, go. On. Okay, um, from obviously, I'm a big fan of both of yours, and I've listened to all your podcasts for the last what, 10, 15 <laughs> years, whatever it is. But Springsteen or Dylan, and why? Oh, you're asking me? Yeah. Oh, who's good. your favorite? Who's your favorite? Oh, good God. Favorite. I suppose that I probably feel more warmly disposed to Bruce Springsteen, but I probably admire Bob Dylan slightly. Well, I don't know. What do I admire Bob Dylan? But Bob Dylan's contribution is pretty massive. <laughs> and over a long period of time, sustained over a long period of time. Whereas I don't think you quite say the same thing about Bruce Springsteen. But I think Bruce Springsteen is the greatest live performer. And that's right. no small thing. Yeah, that's what I was saying. What first drew your you to Springsteen? His the music or the words? Oh, uh, the, 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 the look, the look, okay, the look of him. Yes, <laughs> I, 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 in the 19th century. I think, I, think, I think the look is always more important than anybody. You know, I think it, we we always talk about music and lyrics, and actually, what what we want, really want to do with rock stars is look at them. Yeah. Right. Okay, two more questions left. Which is the best Silver Seas album? Oh, uh, the best Silver Seas album is, is uh, Shatter Revenge. Okay. okay. And uh, the last question, um, I think you've said this before, but I, I'd like to personally ask you about this. What was it like interviewing Sting? Sting? Me? Yeah. Interviewing Sting? I interviewed, I've interviewed Sting a bunch of times. and uh, oh, yeah, too. Amazing. And, uh, I interviewed him once well, in a shower uh, backstage at the Tower Theatre in Philadelphia, where he's wearing nothing but a towel, which cheeky, <laughs> somewhat intimidating, <laughs> you know. And he was it was in the kind of uh, the high noon of, high noon of his youthful beauty in those days, you know. You thought I feel a bit inadequate. <laughs> <laughs> So you know, he was uh, he was fine. He was a show off, and the best interview is very often all show offs. Yeah, yeah. Right. I okay. Him in his house in Hampstead, after he just moved in, and he was the big, pretty much the biggest pop star on the planet. I can remember it was just me, him, briefly his little son, and a childminder and the photographer, and that was it. No agents, no managers, no nothing. Who owned that house before Dave? Somebody very significant. I don't know. Yeah, who did he menu in? Something like oh, that. Oh, probably. Because the first time I interviewed him, actually, was, I go even further back, was when they first broke through with, I don't know, Can't Stand Losing or whatever the first hit was. Yeah. I went to interview him and he, living, he was living with Francis Tomalty. He was married to Francis Tomalty. And Joe was the, the first child, you know, and they were living in a basement flat just near Lambert Grove. Really kind of modest, you know. That was, yeah, it was poverty in those days. <laughs> and then and then every time... Well, they did. Time, they lived in one room, didn't they, with the, yeah, with the baby in a caricot for quite a, a tiny, long time. tiny place, yeah. And he was, you know, he was... Suddenly, they, they were all over, you know, they were in on top of the pops and so forth, but it, he obviously didn't have any money at that stage. I can remember Adrian Deboy going to interview him for Q on the place he has this estate out in, in Italy, and uh, he said he'd see as far as the horizon was land owned by Sting. Yeah. So things did change pretty fundamentally. I'll tell you my favourite my favorite, uh, nuggets about Sting. I was told this by Sting's publisher, Um and I, I interviewed him. I was just fascinated by, I'm fascinated by uh, the fact that mm, people have written loads of songs and had loads of success. In the end, it's one song, really. And uh, I toured the publisher, and he said, um, he said, yes, yeah, true. He says I could go anywhere in the world, check into a hotel, turn on the radio in the room, and within an hour. I'll hear a song by Sting, and it will be Every Breath, every breath You Take. take. <laughs> <laughs> nearly always one song, isn't it? It's nearly always one song. Yeah, yeah. Because the fascinating thing about that is Every Breath You Take is the dullest idea imaginable without Andy Summers' guitar and Stuart Copeland's drumming. 
And Stuart Copeland thought it was a stupid song, didn't he? <laughs> it was a yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Andy Summers makes that song. Hey, Andy Summers Incredible completely embroidery. makes that song. Completely. Otherwise, they're br- the most standard chords in the world. It's a brilliant record. It's a brilliant, it's a genius record. But it's not one man's work. No. <laughs> it's all three of them. And I, I think that I often think that Stuart Copeland's kind of complete lack of interest in the whole thing makes it work because he's just sitting there going, He does yeah, nothing. Will this do? <laughs> he just cracks along. Doesn't he? There's no frills, nothing. It's, it's fantastic. It's a brilliant record. Anyway, sorry, that's enough. That's enough on Sting. That's great. That's lovely. Okay. Um, Mark. God, okay. What is so good about Bob Dylan? Because I'm um, not a fan of Bob Dylan. I've never been into him because um, um, I'm a musician first and then um, uh, I'm into words uh, after that. And I've ne- never really started with Bob Dylan. I like some of his songs, but I don't like some most of the stuff I hear. Um, so why is he so good? And where should I start if I'm going to enter Bob Dylan's world? Where should you start? I would have thought, um, God, Blonde on Blonde, maybe, maybe, maybe John Wesley. Hard- John Wesley Harding's a good place to start. Really simple, really straightforward songs, uh, three verses, four lines each. Um, just beautiful songs, completely timeless. You don't know what century it's written about. Extraordinary, very simple, very pared down. Just him playing the harmonica and the acoustic guitar, bass and drums. Why is he so good? Bob Dylan, just, it's magical, uh, lyrical uh, material. His imagination, his ability to tell stories, the characters he finds in songs, uh, the way he expresses himself. It's kind of poetry set to music. Absolutely extraordinary. I can't think, I can't think what else to say. Not a dynamic performer in any way, but completely holds your attention. And there's so much variety. You know that that, that he he's every form of American roots music is synthesized in Bob Dylan songs. There's folk music, there's jazz, there's jump jive um, in the later period. Um, there's rock and roll, there's R and B, uh, there's country music. It's fantastic. The, it's the books kid. that um, the books that yeah, you you two um, um, have made me buy over the last ten years, which has been numerous and brilliant, and I've loved every one. A lot of the books that the the kind of um, music biographies they often mention Bob Dylan I mean almost everyone does and it's from any era as well they always go oh, I love Bob Dylan I'm thinking well I'm missing a trick here so perhaps I'll have to check that out um <laughs> how good are you really on bass I mean oh god <laughs> you always play it down come on let, very let average indeed very average very I young. can just about manage the great trick which is to play bass and sing at the same time and very okay. few people can do that uh, effectively. I mean, by that, I, I don't mean I can do it in any way. It's very, very hard to do. And I can just about do it. But if you look at the way McCartney plays the bass on songs like, um, you know, All My Loving, and sings and winks at girls in the front row, uh, <laughs> is absolutely great. I don't know how people can play the bass guitar and sing at the same time when they're playing. But it's a Jack Bruce being a really good example, playing in a different rhythm. Next question. Come on, we don't want to waste any time talking about me playing the bass. <laughs> Next. Okay, what was um, what was Tony Blair's favourite song to sing in your band? Oh my lord, um, Tony Blair's favorite as, song. as in the cover version, yeah, yeah, probably Honky Tonk Women. Um, yeah, <laughs> I would have thought um, uh, we did a we did a um, we did a Doobie Brothers Long Train Running. You love that? Oh, yeah. We did. Um, yeah, so gosh, I can't remember now. We did a we that's quite a high song to right sing, now. isn't it? Long train yeah. running, that's yeah, in, in G, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, all right, cool. yeah, okay, great, lovely. Um, oh, I'll have uh, this is a, a quiz question for you then, um, Mark. Uh, what village did uh, Mark uh, arrive in in 1968 on his way back to London and kind of uh, did a little um impromptu performance in a pub? God, you know, there's a fantastic description. It's in Derek Taylor's book, and I've forgotten the name of the village, but basically they're all they're tripping, aren't they? Yeah. And they, they, they decide to stick a pin in a map and, and tell their, their, the driver of their, I think it's Rolls Royce or a Bentley that they're in, to take them to that place. And when they arrive, they go to somebody's house. They go to a pub, I think, eventually. Yeah. And McCartney plays the piano, and I think plays Hey Jude, but I think he's just written. So I can't remember the name, but you'll have to tell me, Jeff. It's Harold. Harold, that's oh, right. Yeah. Dub, double R, isn't it? I it's can't like believe, yeah, you know, a brilliant um, little comedy film would be about to do a fictionalised version that whole weekend. 
because that weekend they go to, is it Bradford? They go on the first day to, to make thingamy Bob with the black dyke. Mills, That's right. That's you know, right. And he tries to get the night porter in the hotel to wash his dog. That's he right. goes with Martha, the sheepdog, who I think in Derek Taylor's book, Derek Taylor's account of this is fantastic about really, he wants the night porter to wash the dog and get rid of the clinkers <laughs> on, the, on the nether end of Martha. And the night porter's <laughs> thinking, whatever they're paying me, it's not enough. <laughs> yeah. No one's going to It would make a job. really good, it'd That's make a incredible. really good film. It would, it would. So is that lo- last of your questions for Mark? It is, yes, yes. Thanks, right. Jeff. Well, they, they, there's some useful things come out of there, I, I like to feel. Um, I think so, yeah. It's, it's good to be put on the spot. So uh, y- your birthday is today and you're off out this evening. So are you you sleeping the rest of the day to recuperate? I know, <laughs> keep I'm, going, your strength? I'm going into school to teach, so... Oh, right. Oh, good grief. Yes, you. Jeff's a peripatetic guitar teacher. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll be out there. You'll be out there doing fine work. Well, lovely to talk to you. Good for you. And have a good birthday, Jeff. Enjoy have a the good, meal. Have a good birthday. We'll no doubt see you on the quiz. See you later. See I, you I, might soon. Be a bit, I might be a bit tipsy on the quiz. So, you know. Okay. <laughs> we'll bear that in mind. The Word Podcast. Fix yourself a drink, and it's like being in the pub. So, questions from the massive. Uh, Simon Brock says, box sets, is there anything more worthwhile left to an- anthologize that hasn't already already been anthologized? If not, we'll need a new format so that the labels can make a fresh start. Actually, I, 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 I just, I, I'd make one point, Simon, is that I think the labels are obviously trying to make money out of these things. But but what's interesting is the level of public demand for these things. You know what I mean? Is that there are people, not a huge number of people, but there are people who are always just looking for the next you know, kind of unreleased so-and-so, you know, with the with the outtakes and, you know, the, the version that I never got to hear before. And, and, then, and then kind of the more expensive the box is, the things are in, the more people seem to like it. You know, people get a lot of joy out of those things, don't you think, Mark? The more bits, the what the, the old things must pass. The reason George Harrison had the little miniature gnomes. Not that I've got one. <laughs> How come what it cost? I mean, hundreds of dollars, wasn't it? But there's just something really exciting about this whole little thing being packaged up for you. And, and it's uh, also all these people posting videos of them unboxing this stuff, you know. It's kind of that's like, right. They, they, they get a lot of pleasure out And also it. you can't deny that the, the the if you're interested in a group that any outtakes are incredible. At a quite it's very quick tangent. Dave, you you were listening to that uh, Let It Be uh, yeah, outtakes yeah. thing. It's it's on Spotify this morning. Yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> I spent about 10 minutes into you get you get them singing Save the Last Dance for Me, sung to the tune of Don't Let Me Down. Because <laughs> they're exactly the same chords. You yeah. get them doing Wake Up Little Susie and going into I Me Mine. You, they do the old rock and roll of the walk. Billy Preston leads a soul jam backed by the Beatles. That's fantastic. What's the one that I I, I was looking at it this morning? I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to you get, and you get Ringo, you get Ringo playing Octopus's Garden for the first time. Really embarrassed and self-conscious and playing the piano. And they're all being really sweet and encouraging. There's a lovely bit where they're about to go into a uh, polythene pan where George Harrison is ordering his lunch from Mal. He says, Mal, oh, can, yes. I have, can I have the cheese sauce on the cauliflower? Yes, today? he's, he's suddenly really keen yesterday. on your cheese sauce. Yeah, I like to have cauliflower. Sauce. I like to have cheese sauce. It's <laughs> absolutely incredible. Yeah, that that was where, the way. where Ringo uh, comes in, they go, Happy New Year. And he goes, Hare Krishna. So yeah. brilliant. <laughs> Oh dear. Uh, the um no, the one that, that struck me was uh, Maggie May stroke fancy my chances with you. Oh yeah, thank you my chances with you. It's incredible. I, where's that come from? I've never, I've never heard, heard, heard I've never heard fancy yeah, yeah. my chances before. It's uh, brilliant, isn't that, it? that, that's uh, that that's great fun. And of course it's all on it's all out there for you to, for yeah. you to hear now if you if you're so minded. Um Cruisers Creek, another catchy name. A he bought the new Steely Dan live CD. I didn't know there was one, but okay. And he loves it. But it doesn't feel right that Donald Fagan and his band should be calling themselves Steely Dan. It seems disrespectful to Walter Banco. What do you think? The, the question there is, 
is that if Walter Becker were alive and for some reason he couldn't do it or he didn't want to do it or whatever, and was asked, would he mind? What What do you think he'd say? I think he'd say that he would mind. Yeah, but the fact that he mind. isn't here means that Donald Fagan is at liberty to do whatever he wants. Yeah. I don't know, blame him, really. I don't so think it's all right. And also, Donald Fagan is the voice of Steely He's Dan. He's the voice of Steely Dan. He sounds like he can make the Steely Dan sound. And he wrote, you know, co-wrote. We're saying it's songs. legit. I think, I think I, I'd, I'd give him slack, really. Yeah. Uh, D- David, Jones, uh, David James says the Stones no longer playing Brown Sugar. And should bands self-edit their past? God, don't you think in that case, yes. I think probably yes. I'm <laughs> amazed, actually, that what they've done is saying we're not going to play Brown Sugar anymore because um, they're doing that because before someone else says, the Stones are playing a song about a <laughs> slavery ship where women are chained up on the deck and somebody goes down and uh, has his evil way with them. Yeah. And, uh, and, and and the whole thing is being celebrated. It's fantastic. And the way, Mick says, we might do it some other time. And Keith goes, I, I don't really understand what the beef is with the sisterhood here. Yeah. <laughs> it's, somebody, it's absolutely hilarious. I think somebody having sang to rights. It is a very, very dodgy <laughs> song. I'm amazed they've been playing it for so long, actually. And also, Amazing. yeah. And also, they don't play. They haven't played it as well as they made. No. They, since the day the record was made, they never played it as well no, as, the re- as the record. But anyway, and also Lee Ward. On the while we're on the subject of the Stones, uh, Lee Ward wants to know what we think of uh, of McCartney's quote in the New Yorker about the Rolling Stones, saying he'd always thought of them as a bl- as a, just a blues cover band. <laughs> Which, well, that's just him just trying to get the publicity for his uh, <laughs> or his new promo, his lyric book, and he's brilliant at it. Can his ability to come up with a line? I interviewed him around the time that he was doing for Radio Times, around the time that he was playing the Queen's birthday party at Buckingham Palace, and he said he was going to play Her Majesty, and he came up with a line that the Queen was a babe. You know, oh yeah, yeah, classic. yeah, yeah. He yeah. just put that in the interview because that's the headline. That's what's going to get in all the newspapers. Superb. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and by I think dismissing the Rolling Stones as a, I think you know the the Rolling Stones don't have anything like the breadth of the Beatles, but to suggest that they're just a blues cover band is is a, is a little bit below. The it's top. a bit mean, but if you look at the things that the that the Beatles were playing in the early days, you know, you look at those Hamburg days, they were playing "Till There Was You," uh, "Your Feet's Too Big," yes, you know, "Red Cells" and so that "Taste of Honey," "Shake of Araby." Besame Mucho. I mean, they came from kind of music hall and old song ballads and all sorts of traditions that the, the Stones didn't. Stones came from a narrower background. Yeah. Uh, Tronic Youth says the new Velvet Underground documentary is out this Friday. Friday. Is there a band who sold fewer records in their day who've been more influential? But probably not. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what struck me. I was thinking of the Velvet Underground in response to this. I remember buying a Velvet Underground record. The first time I bought a Velvet Underground record was in WH Smith's in Dewsbury in 1970. No, I tell a lie. It was Boots. <laughs> I'm going further, Mark. It was Boots, okay? So all I'm saying is if the Velvet Underground had penetrated, you know, the consciousness of the world sufficiently to get into boots in Dewsbury in 1969. That's quite remarkable, isn't it, really? You know what I mean? And then, so we're talking about how underground they are and how, how nobody knew about them and, you know, how unpopular they are. Well, you know, it's all relative, isn't it, really? You know, uh, they, they were always kind of known. People didn't necessarily buy their records, but they were kind of known, and they were in record shops, and they were reviewed, and they were known about, weren't they? They were. They were written about incredibly extensively, weren't they? Yeah, and and have been for, you know, 50, 50, 60 years. It's just, it's a different kind of I think ultimately they did sell a lot of records, actually. They probably did. Very early on, it's just that first album that didn't, at the time, but subsequently would have sold enormously. Yeah, probably. Uh, Gabe Rosa uh, says, have we noted the passing of uh, Apple Scruff, Lizzie Bravo? Oh, Lizzie Bravo, what a great story. There was an obituary in the Times. That shows you how big the Beatles are, that one of the Apple Scruffs who sang backing vocal on Across the Universe in whenever it was, 1967, 1968, um, 
gets an obituary in the Times. I thought it was such a great story. Yeah. And she was standing, she, when she was 16, she flew to London, didn't she? Well, her, her parents bought her a ticket. She went straight from Heathrow Airport to Abbey Road and stood outside the Beatles recording Sergeant Pepper and basically just stayed there for about seven months outside waiting for the Beatles to come in and go. And they were, they, she sang on that song and she said, at one point, my heart was, Lennon was singing beside us, my heart was beating so hard, I thought it would actually come out on the record. Um, he, you'd be able to hear it in the microphone. It's fantastic. Good for her. And uh, talking of uh, people's heart beating, hearts beating in that kind of context, will bring us back neatly to the person we were discussing right at the beginning of the podcast, is Paul Simon. And uh, in, in Paul Simon's 80th birthday, reminded me to look once again at my favorite, one of my favorite clips on YouTube, which is uh, probably the first time I saw a fan being summoned from an audience to sing a song with star on stage. And that is this clip of this, this woman called, I think she's called Raina. And he is, um, people are shouting and this is a Paul Simon concept from my dad 15 years ago or whatever. People are shouting for songs from the audience and she, she must shout, do, do Duncan. I learned to play the guitar on Duncan. And he says, come up and show us. He says, come up and show us. And she gets more and more overjoyed and thrilled. First, she's just but, absolutely terrified. But she's, she's just on it. She's, she? But she's g- g- holding on to herself. Like she's yeah, hyperventilating. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, what have I done? You know what I mean? He's going to hand me his guitar and I'm going to have to sing this song. Yeah, yeah. And she does it. And so it's a, it's a wonderful moment. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. 